So the movie opens with Morbius going to a bat infested cave in South America, I think, to offer up his blood. However, this opening is kind of just a hook to draw on the viewers because it immediately cuts to a flashback of a young Morbius. In this scene we meet Milo, who shares the same blood disease as Morbius, and randomly out of nowhere, Milo's machine that helps his blood malfunctions. And somehow, Morbius is able to repair it. The writers brush it off with Morbius just being gifted, and that doesn't really explain the fact that this kid shouldn't know how to fix a complicated machine that was made by professionals. I feel like there could have been a more natural way to introduce his intelligence, but whatever, he's smart. Through the sequence, we kind of speedrun development since Morbius gets shipped off to a gifted school for repairing something with a spring, and he leaves Milo a letter. While reading it, the wind magically swoops it up and takes it away, forcing Milo to go outside where some bullies are. This is a weird and contrived way to get Milo to go outside. On top of the fact that there is no shot, he'll be able to find his note given that it'll take him a long time to get out of the building with his disorder. But magically the wind doesn't touch it once it hits the floor. After catching up to his elusive note, he engages in a violent encounter, and for some reason, other kids hate crippled children, which is just a weird form of conflict. Conflict. It seems like the writers are trying to get the backstory done as fast as possible at the cost of the pace in the writing. Quickly going to the present day, we find an older Morbius receiving an award for his development of artificial blood. And right away, you can just tell that they're going to use this as a cop-out to avoid the fact that Morbius will need to drink blood since he becomes a vampire later on. A very convenient way to make the character more of a good guy while deleting the conflict of having to potentially kill innocent people for blood. After a day at work where Morbius discovers that mixing bat DNA with mice DNA successfully works, he stops in to hang out with his old friend Milo. And like a true friend, Milo tells Morbius that he should never fall in love with other people, because Milo reads books in which love doesn't work out. I read about it in books all the time. Books? Really? Yeah. Wow. This is kind of a weird conversation point because these are supposed to be long-time friends, and he should be encouraging his friend to find love for the short time they have left, instead of selfishly trying to influence him to hang out with himself. Seems kind of manipulative and selfish, but hey, don't judge. Getting to the point of the scene though, Morbius says he wants to do an all-in play by mixing their DNA with a bat, since it worked on a mouse. Which, that kind of makes sense because they are desperate for time, however, I feel like it's even riskier to not conduct more experiments before diving into the deep end. But hey, we don't want a boring movie of a scientist going through the scientific method, let's get to the good shit. Since it's illegal to do this procedure, Morbius decides to do it on a freighter in international waters. After the procedure, Morbius gets his powers, and for some reason, there's a group of mercenaries on board. I don't really know why they're here, and I feel like the writers just wanted a forced action scene to introduce Morbius's new powers. And I kind of feel bad for them, because these are guys trying to defend themselves from a terrifying and dangerous monster. Also, before this action scene starts, the mercenaries throw Morbius' scientist friends and potential love interest, Martine, to the ground, which knocks her out since she was trying to stop them. So. Morbius now has motivation to kill these people. The following action is pretty dark and violent, but is clearly hidden and muted because of the PG-13 rating. Like a guy got his throat cut open and bled out, and blood got splattered on screen multiple times, so it's weird that this movie isn't rated R, and it's clearly because Sony wanted a larger demographic to be able to see the movie. At the expense of fully committing to a darker and more violent movie and actually showing what's happening. After the action scene, Morbius turns back to a more human form, and I find it kind of weird how he spontaneously got a six pack from becoming a super vampire. I don't think that's technically a part of his power list, but alright, I'll roll with that. So Morbius broadcasts a mayday signal and jumps overboard and goes back to his lab in New York. And guess what? That MacGuffin artificial blood invention that was introduced earlier comes back, and now Morbius can drink it without harming anyone, leaving his moral conscious uncorrupted, besides that group of mercenaries he brutally killed. The writers do set up that this isn't a permanent solution because he's getting deteriorating returns from drinking artificial blood. However, this doesn't really end up mattering because the story doesn't last long enough for Morbius to run out of artificial blood. Moving along though, during some endurance tests, Miles shows up to the lab looking for Morbius, and he asks him for the quote unquote cure. And instead of going into the details as to why the cure is terrible and is a curse, Morbius just briefly says it's really bad, and alienates his best friend. 
Like it could have been really easy to explain to him and convince him why he shouldn't take it, but I assume the writers are leading to Milo becoming a villain, so it comes across as a contrivance. Later on, a poor nurse gets jumped by a vampire, which puzzles Morbius when he finds out about the news. Hmm, I wonder who that could be. Morbius hopefully makes the same connection and is about to leave the building until being stopped by two detectives looking into his case since the boat incident. They figure out that another body there has been drained of blood, so just before they arrest him, Morbius runs for it. And by that I mean he flies up a stairwell and makes it to the roof. While up there, he gets swept away in some terrible visual effects which I guess is supposed to be wind? And somehow, one of the detectives made it to the rooftop in 20 seconds flat by climbing the stairs. Like that's literally impossible and and it's hilarious to me that this wasn't rewritten. Then the detective pulls a gun on Morbius and it cuts to him in prison. Which, again, immediately doesn't make any sense because just 10 seconds prior, Morbius was able to dodge a bullet, so I don't know how he wasn't able to keep running for it. But whatever, I guess the writers couldn't come up with a better way to have Morbius detained, or let alone the plot point being logical by any degree. While in prison, Milo passes as Morbius' lawyer and gives him a packet of blood before he leaves. Which wouldn't be possible because you're supposed to empty all of your belongings before meeting with a prisoner, or going through security in general, especially one that's a prime suspect in murder. Then Milo leaves and forgets his cane that he walked in with to give Morbius the idea that he took the cure. And it's also funny that a guard is completely fine with Milo giving Morbius a potential weapon, or the guard is terrible at their job and didn't catch that. So as a result of this, Morbius breaks out of prison and tracks Milo down with his echolocation. He finds him on a sidewalk buying a newspaper from someone who kind of says something negative about Morbius, which is definitely justified since he's tied to killing a bunch of mercenaries. Because of this, Milo gets mad at him for talking bad about his friend, and kills him out in the open. That seems like a terrible idea given that they were in a brightly lit area with people walking around, and I guess this also means that Milo is a cold-blooded killer now? Was this because he was bullied as a kid? I genuinely don't know. Morbius then confronts him and Milo says that for the nurse in particular, he didn't have control. But that's irrelevant because he just killed an innocent bystander like one minute ago. Then they go through the stereotypical dialogue of, This isn't who you are. I know you. You're a good person. Then they get physical and some cops try to stop them. To which Milo kills them and dances over their corpses and says this, All our life. We lived with death hanging over us. Why shouldn't they know what it feels like? This motivation is completely devoid of logic. Firstly, it's not the fault of these innocent people as to why you had a blood disease. And secondly, flat out killing them doesn't achieve your supposed objective of making them feel like you did. You're just murdering them. So Milo just becomes a crazy psychopath with practically no build up other than that one small moment from his childhood of getting bullied. I guess he held on to that pent up aggression for his entire life. Morbius figures out how to harness the weird VFX wind caused by a train and flies down the subway, escaping from having to fight Milo. To quickly recap, a bit of time goes by where there's a scene with the detectives discovering the cops, Morbius meeting with Martine, and Morbius finding some illegal operation and scaring them away so he could turn it into a lab. Then we have a weird dancing scene with Milo that will have Doctor Who fans drooling. I feel bad for Matt Smith because he probably had to get ripped and worked out for months just for this one scene. This leads into Milo going to a bar where he hits on a lady and some guys yell at him for whatever reason, so Milo goes outside and waits for them to come out so he can kill them. These last 5 minutes as a whole feel pretty much pointless to the movie and is overall redundant. Because prior to this, Milo killed a bunch of cops, so why show him in another extended scene killing even more people by himself? They later excuse this as there being a security camera in the parking lot, so now people know there's another killer on the loose. But he could have achieved the same thing by there being a security camera in the subway to avoid redundancy. After this, Milo visits Martine to try and figure out where Morbius is. She ends up lying to him, but he knows she's lying because he has super hearing and he can hear her heartbeat. As a result, he follows her to Morbius' hideout, and while there, they decide to conveniently leave their hideout and go to the rooftop to kiss. This all happens just so that Milo can witness this happen and it's extremely awkward. I couldn't help but laugh at the face Milo makes while watching them. 
Milo goes home, and the doctor that's been taking care of him all his life confronts him and reasonably is repulsed by what he's done and has become. He doesn't do anything wrong to Milo, and he kills him regardless, so at this point, I'm kind of just disconnected to the villain and what his ideals are, his objectives, and how he's changed significantly when in comparison Morbius has stayed the same character after taking the cure. Because of his vile and wicked nature, Milo kidnaps Martine to try and lure Morbius over to him. Before he gets there, Milo kills Martine. As she's about to die, a horny Morbius bends over and starts to make out with her, which is very weird and off-putting. Angered by the death of Martine, Milo and Morbius are propelled into a mind-numbing final fight scene, where you literally can't see anything, the editing is extremely jarring, the set piece is made up of only darkness, the VFX is atrocious as usual, and because of all of this, the filmmakers decide to throw in random slow-mo shots so the audience can actually tell what's going on. And after three brain-bleeding minutes of action, they fall through the ground as if it was made of paper mache and make their way into the subway. Morbius calls for some bats and then comedically falls to the ground. Then somehow, like, thousands of bats materialize out of nowhere to aid Morbius in fighting Milo. Firstly, there's no way there's this many bats casually hanging around in the underground network of New York. And secondly, he can now control bats and uses them to attack Milo? I guess the writers made that up because according to his list of powers, that doesn't exist. Or at least to what I'm seeing in his wiki. And I also don't know how all these bats somehow gave Morbius enough energy to rise up again. Was it just a confidence boost? Uh, what? Really, nothing makes sense about this, and there are so many bats flying around on the screen that it's giving me a headache. This entire sequence feels like a nightmare fever dream, and I feel sorry for any kid who went to go see this movie in the movie theater. So yeah, that's basically the end of the movie, and he may be thinking, hey, Vulture was in the trailer, right? Where is he? He hasn't shown up yet. Well, you're in luck, because he's only in the end credits scene. Apparently, he came from the MCU when the multiverse was cracking open in Spider-Man No Way Home. And that immediately contradicts what happens in No Way Home, because the whole point of that was people who knew Spider-Man were being teleported to that universe. So Vulture randomly gets sent into the universe with Morbius. Yeah, I don't even think the writers know why he's here. Then there's a second end credit scene where Vulture now miraculously has all his gear back. And in this scene, he meets up with Morbius and asks to team up. And we all know that isn't going to happen, and I don't know if this is some kind of Sinister Six build-up? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I doubt most of you guys have seen this movie, so you're welcome. I jumped on the grenade, so you could watch the summary of the most stupid moments in the movie. Thank you for watching, and have a great day, and please watch a better movie than Morbius.